Yeah. Welcome back to the show. Ned, Mose, and Cookie. We're adults, and yeah. we're reviewing episodes some of the time and reminiscing. Today, we are answering your questions that yep. you have submitted to me via Instagram. So Instagram is, of course. For, for future episodes, if you're yeah. a listener, if you're a Ned head out there, you're thinking, how do I get my question answered by Ned, Mose, and Cookie? You got to follow us on Instagram, and mm. every now yeah. and then, I'll throw up on the story. See. I won't throw up on my story. I will put up. I will, if somebody asks for that. Uh, depends on how much they pay. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, right. We will put up a little box that says, ask us questions, and we'll go through them, and maybe we'll answer your question. Yeah. Sure. Questions, no comments. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no comments, please. Um, <laughs> questions only. No comments, Preguntas. no critiques, please. Turn only up. questions. Questions. <laughs> um, I get enough of those. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, All right. You want to so, start us off yes. with So, mm, Michael J, two M's. So that's mm. what the mm, came Michael from. J Fox, yeah. Here. Well, tips for being an artist turning 30. Mm. Continue to reinvent yourself. You've been an artist turning 30. We've, we've, we've all, all yeah. been an artist turning 30. Not me, me too. Yeah. Um, I really think you got to um, re like you gotta like reevaluate once you turn thirty, and mm. Mm. it's okay to say that different things mean either more or less to you now, and maybe something like maybe you're you just reassess your goals and reassess what really makes you happy. You know, I think being an artist is incredible, but I also think. A life of like that I can feel secure in is important for me, even mm -hmm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. So that security um, comes in kind of like pursuing other things, and also in figuring out that everything that you do in your life is like sort of an art form, and to do it on your own is just as noble as to do it in front of other people. Mm. But you kind of got to look at why you're looking at what you're looking for to be successful as an, as an artist, right? To, to call yourself that or whatever. But I think art happens every day. What did Ralph Waldo Emerson say? To affect the day is the highest of arts. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. I'll just like add to that because that's, that's it. Is it it kind of happened to me. Like turning 30 forced me. I didn't have to consciously do it. Life hit me kind of hard when I turned 30 and like I had to reassess and reinvent and uh, yeah, I think through your 20s, like go out and fail, go out and have dreams, let them change, let, try for them, let them fail, learn things, grow. It's all good. Do that your whole fucking 20s. Shit hit different when I, when I turned 30. That security does become more of a thing. It's like, hold on, all these artistic dreams that I pursued in my 20s, um, a lot of them I didn't hit and they were supposed to provide me with the security that I was looking for. That you, yeah, that, that I need, need. security yes. as in food, as everything. Yes, yeah. beyond just like, yeah, like personal spiritual security. No, no, my like security in life. And turning thirty, you really have to look at like, how am I, how am I going to get to the life that I want? And you really have to ask those different questions. What do I want my life to look like in the next five, ten years? Mm -hmm. well, what What does security look like to me? What does my art look like to me? what hasn't worked over my 20s like it a lot of it for me was processing my 20s what worked what didn't what uh what do i need to change what do i need to adjust what do i need to let go of mm -hmm. uh, where am i self-sabotaging yeah right where, yes. where have i stayed stagnant so even though i've been an artist since i was 21 nothing has really changed in my artistic repertoire or what i can offer now that i'm turning 30 right so that tells me either a you're not focused on the art or B, it just doesn't draw your interest, or you feel like you don't like it's not something you want to work on, mm. right? Or you feel like maybe you don't actually want to be seen, and you're grappling with that. So you can want things and 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 not be totally, you know, uh, I don't know, equipped to do them. Yeah, I saw a great meme uh, that said like being an artist is constantly and simultaneously wanting to be seen and wanting to hide. Yep, mm. and you're like constantly dealing with these two forces, and I feel that yeah and, and yeah at 30 you just gotta assess for me i like got to reassess my failures and my wants and do i still want to do this because mm -hmm. i could hop off the artist train or like make it much more personal just mm -hmm. have like my music for me maybe you know read plays and still enjoy it but but take the the pressure off like my big dreams and shit yeah um 
but I got to reassess, am I still like in this for the next 10, 20 years? Like right. I got to recommit and I found inside myself, man, I love this shit. I'm doing it for the rest of my life. Like yeah. I'm, I'm in it, I'm in it. But I had to recommit, I had to come back to it. Yeah. And then it's empowering. Yeah. It's like, I'm not doing this just because I've been doing it so long. I chose, I chose in the now, oh no, I'm still doing this. Yeah. I'm in these streets. In these streets, I'm out here. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that I'll add since, since he asked for tips and, you know, mentioned the thirties, the thirties kind of means adulthood. Mm -hmm. Um, a rigid tip to add on to that is monetize your, uh, craft. Mm. Some people have not done that. And I know that myself, I struggled with monetizing it cause I'm so, or have been so airy and I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm doing this cause I love it. And people see my expression and they'll da 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 da. But you also got to keep those lights on. And yeah. I, I hate to make it about money because it should be detached, but it's so intertwined. Well, if you love this art, then you have to do everything around it to allow you to continue to do it. We, we live in a society where it's not like you can just be artists. You live in an industry too, right? So you do some things for art, you do others for commerce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And both of those things keep you within an industry where sometimes you get to do really good work. Yep. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, music's been a strange one for me. I, I, I absolutely love music. It's a part of me. I've gone through different phases with it. I was signed to Universal at a certain point. Really Not thought I was phase, gonna, phase. You thought I was gonna have phase. yeah. Thought I was gonna be a uh, like a big artist. What that fell through. Started working with these other producers. Thought that was gonna happen. This cycle with music throughout my life. It's just to kind of speak against your point a little bit. Even though even though I agree entirely, you have to find how you're gonna pay your bills. Like you cannot leave that. And your art is a good place to monetize. However. Every time I've pursued music, the industry side of it, the commerce side of it, really hard and like tried to make shit happen with it, after a certain point, it burns me out and I don't want to touch it for a while. I don't want to touch mm -hmm. music for a while. I went through a year uh, after like hustling it, did the Patreon, was making music the all the time. The performance with Seal the at performance Hollywood with Seal right. was fucking huge. I was like in it and on my music path, but something about like turning it into this sale and need for it to come back to me um in a certain way disconnected me from like my love of it mm -hmm. so it's a weird thing when it's an art because it's yeah. it, it can pay your bills and it can't it needs to be external in some ways but also some of our art is so like personally connected yeah. to us and it's a weird balance to strike between that art and commerce some mm -hmm. of the time yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you don't only have to sell your art sometimes yeah. you have to sell other things in order to be able to do your, your art, art. And exactly it. exactly but yeah no matter what in your 30s i think you can no longer just accept that i'm an artist and but, i don't have money but like, here's the, yeah and here's the deal so, at the end mm -mm. of the day you just have to know what works what is most important to you if it's to be free and you think that comes outside of financial free you just gotta honor you but don't be mad at a life that you don't even know like you don't even know really what you're asking for right like you gotta just be kind of tuned in to what you're looking for don't, if you really want security, don't bash yourself over the head that you're not going to be the starving artist, right? Right. Like, I had to tell myself that a long time. I mean, I thought that I was like this ride or die for the craft, and I am. But I'm always going to have a roof and something to eat other than SpaghettiOs. I'm going to try and do that, whether I have to work inside or outside of acting at all. Like, exactly. I'm going to make sure that that's my baseline. And I, I have worked a long time at other jobs that exactly. were not acting, that were, you know, at the front of a yoga studio working in a law office. Like, mm -hmm. I, I'm... I, I can't just go by and not not fuel mm -mm. because that for me makes me less artistic than yeah. than you know no it does because it's that. not sustainable exactly so you have to find a way to it's sustain. survival yeah. and that's another yeah. thing that creates a need for art as opposed to like this space mm, for art. that that's too a point. dude nice. that too when fucking I need an audition I need to book an audition for my survival what an awful place to be in like for my actual like I need this paycheck dude that's brutal man now i'm not free to mm -mm. fucking make choices now i have this weird attachment need like it's not good mm -mm. it's not good mm -mm. yeah nope. and you try point. to fill all uh, all these uh, holes that you think they're looking for. Uh, i know mm -hmm. um, it becomes so stilted so stiff so so performance yes like, yeah um yeah. great question thanks for that i loved that because that's definitely you know, it's been a, thing. A, been a theme of my 30s so far. Same. Is reconciling that. Same. Yeah. And really asking what I want. I spend time now, uh, especially we drive a lot in LA. I spend time in my car sometimes, like actively saying, okay, while I'm driving, 
I just want to spend this time just ruminating on what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want it to feel like? What do I want? And just asking that question forward, it's been really helpful actually taking conscious time to think through it mm. and feel through it mm -hmm. and feel into it. Yeah. Manifest. Um, Thanks for the question. I like this one because I just want to bring up a certain part of uh, my life. Y you were there for uh, some of it, Daniel. Um, Turn up group. It Gma fan. Yeah. yeah. Asked, how was Hollywood Valley life? Uh, they said during Neds, but I'm going to take it after Neds. And they said, mm -hmm. any cool parties or only in LA moments? And I just want to take the moment to share. Go so ahead. third season of Neds, my family and I found this house to rent in the Hollywood Hills. Perfect. Um, we were just going to rent it for six months. Uh, it used to be owned by Anthony Kiedis of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He was two owners before us, so we started renting it from the owners who got it from him. Like, that was just cool L.A. history. We're in Anthony Kiedis' house in the Hollywood Hills. It was up near the Hollywood sign. It was this fun, like, just great house for me and my family. We thought we'd be there six months. Then the owners wanted to sell it, and my parents kind of loved it so much and couldn't super afford it, but they were like, we have to take this house. Like, we mm. can't let go of this house. It's such a special property. Um, so my parents bought that house in the third season of Ned's. And so post Ned's, like during Ned's, we would go up there and have, we'd go up there and have yep. parties post, in the backyard. Though. And But post, once we yeah. got older, because during Ned's we were, I don't know, we were all little baby children, but yeah. post Ned's up into my teenage years, I don't think my parents had ever left me alone in that house for like a, a night. I just, they like never went on trips without us or something. But then when I was, I think I was 18 and they left for like 10 days on a vacation and me and all my friends knew like, oh, it's on, like <laughs> it's on. And literally oh, we had like a week of like, Hollywood movie style teen party beer ragers. Pong, bro. Beer pong Great. in the house, which it's was so dumb. I never yeah. did that again. We, we had a backyard, so that's where the beer pong goes. We were playing it in the fucking dining room. Yep. I could not get the beer smell out of that house for, for like bro. weeks. So when my parents came home, they were like, <clears throat> yeah, you've been in here. But mm -hmm. they knew at that point I was 18, like as long as like we didn't trash the house, I, I, I didn't tell them I was having the party. When they smelled the beer, it's like they weren't stoked, but obviously like they weren't. They weren't like coming down on me for it because yeah. we we took care of the house we like relaxed. cleaned were... it up after yeah. it was all good but but i still remember for for they were gone 10 days so we did like two weekends of just fucking Lit. literally like i feel like hundreds be. of kids and all of at hollywood that time, would come through yeah That's i mean true. uh uh vinnie and kyle from phantoms dope mm -hmm. electronic uh act they were there mm -hmm. i think vinnie like spilled some wine and drew like got on him about it of like respect the fucking house bro uh, yeah um i think nick braun was there yeah usually uh, yeah. yeah nick braun like man if you could have if you could have been there if you could have seen it and it was it was kind of like phones weren't as everything wasn't being documented oh yeah then. we were just living i, I don't in think the i moment, have bro. any photo from those experiences like Dang. any and wow. it's kind of beautiful yeah but yeah. i wish i could see some images from those parties because they were just it was too many people. Wow. Bro, we packed my crazy. fucking house. It was so fun. It was, it was so epic, fun. man. We would be on top of the roof, everything. I smoked my first joint on top of your roof, man. I remember Ooh. that. Yeah. That wasn't during that party, but that was just me and Daniel. <laughs> it was beautiful, man. It was beautiful. We were like Changed looking at the Hollywood sign, just talking about life. Daniel was a good boy, right? Damn. Daniel was a good Christian boy with ideas about right and wrong. Yeah. And then as you do as a teenager, you start to stretch these boundaries and uh i got to smoke daniel out for his first time and man it was beautiful it was lit it was lit it was Magical. literally lit yeah. yeah good times man good times <laughs> that's incredible yeah i just want to share that but but and daniel have you smoked since uh marijuana the marijuana's yeah <laughs> never like, again once you pop you just can't stop <laughs> oh no. uh, yeah uh, i'm more of an edible guy mm. these yeah. days yep yeah. Mm. But uh, but yeah, 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 we weed has a, a special place, you know, but you got to get things done in life. So you're not always going to want to choose that, you know, yeah. and I guess it's it's no longer just a California thing. I guess more of these states are like legalizing it and everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a nice alternative to all the other horrible, um, you know, vices. You yeah. Can have. Yeah. I think in balance, it can serve an amazing it's an amazing oh, yeah. thing. It can serve an amazing purpose at yeah. times. And sometimes it can be a problem. Yeah, how about yourself? You ever interacted with the marijuana? The um, cannabis? <laughs> Let me think. You skipped that and just went right to. <laughs> no, every night ended with the cannabis. Yeah. Nice. Yep. 
And like, even uh, like we were at part, like there was a young Hollywood at the time. Like it, it was a small community of us out here living this experience. So they're definitely not just at my house. Like you would end up at parties that like all of us kids, anyone who was on Disney and Nick at that time, we all had some overlap somewhere. Yep. Mm -hmm. And like, and any teenager, you're going to parties as a teenager sometimes. And like, mm -hmm. this was no different. Yep. Yeah. We'd all end up somewhere sometime. Oh, oh and God, I'm just trying to did you just, my did you just back. fart? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I swear you just Where ripped ass, manners? dude. Yeah. I swear you just turned and just like pulled a fart out of yeah, your ass. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dug deep I for did. that one. It's not, it's not like you, you really like, like you dare take your face away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. I have my lower like back. Ass, your lower ass. Your lower back. Your <laughs> my yeah. lower right. You were, it's right here. It's right. I know where there. the anus is, Lindsay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> know where it's located. It's I know where like parts painful. are made. <laughs> oh my god. Um, Andy M ninety four asks Carmelo Anthony as una gran persona. Is he a good person? Oh, you met him. Yeah, but he was the, on our show. Yeah. Sure. He was on our show for an episode. Uh, right yeah, on. of course. I just want to. Yeah, of course. Carmelo Anthony. came on. Yeah, that's a grand person. Sure. Oh. Sure. Go on. Bang, bang. Oh, this is a Ned's question. Glad Fitman asked. Glad Fitman. What are the capabilities slash limitations of the little chip on Cookie's glasses? <laughs> Ooh, you know, I, I'll, I'll dive I'll let, deep. Yeah, I'll let you answer that. So, uh, it, those glasses have all of the capabilities and limitations of Google Glass, mm. which came out. Uh, Cookie was able to surf the web, all right, so he could access whatever information he wanted, you know, kind of like Wikipedia. He could just search some terms. He could also hack into uh, any type of electronic transmissions that were happening anywhere else. So that was a great tool to have. He could hijack GPS, man. So much stuff. And this little viewfinder, I mean, or this little thing he was twiddling was like the mouse, you know. There we go. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've heard people ask, I think people got confused that we reference Cookie as a cyborg so often that like, I feel like people ask me like, was he like actually a cyborg? Oh yeah. Like, no, uh. that's how we referenced him because he used technology yeah. and had augmented yeah. reality with it. Like you're not an actual robot. Yeah, what is that, a meta human? What would you call someone like, he's like, is he? He's like, is he? Where do you plug him up? <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, that was some great stuff. Man. Yeah, you weren't supposed to be like an actual robot. You know what I mean? I can't reference one person on this because I, I've actually seen a lot of people asking something along the lines of how do I deal with a breakup? How do I get over an ex? Like there's like a bunch in there where people are asking for that time, which is something we're going to go through many times in our life. But how do I deal with that time where I've been broken up with or a breakup, getting over someone. Um, yeah, I, I will start and say every uh, breakup and especially the bigger ones from bigger relationships in my life um, have been really sacred times after that breakup. Painful, raw, but there's something about that heartbreak mm -hmm. that kind of clarifies what matters in my life. There's something that like, if you actually slow down trying to escape that heartbreak, but just kind of come back to yourself um, and feel it, I, I have always found like this truth comes back to me. This voice comes back to me. Cause in the relationship we were creating a we, there was a we and I was doing something in relation to this other person. And it was beautiful and great. And parts of letting go of that and grieving that are, are terrible and it hurts. Um, and it's uncomfortable in the transition. However, I'm always coming back to myself after a breakup. I'm not less of me. I'm coming back into myself of not being ref I'm not referencing this other person anymore. And um, yeah, I think for me, it's, it's like, it's not looking back. It's not trying to hold on. It's feeling everything that comes up because there's a whole process. I mean, however long you were in that relationship, I don't know what the math is, but there's a certain amount of time where you're still going to be processing that relationship. However long I thought you it were was together, like double the time that you were together. No, 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 no. Mm. I, I thought it was half. I thought it was the opposite. Oh, that's that's I think what I, I think mean. it's like. Half, yeah. However long you were together, half, half of, of that it mm -hmm. is going to be this process of uncoupling and you have to let the feelings come that come. You're going to pass by all sorts of things that remind you of the good times, all the things you did together. And part of that is letting those feelings come, but also like, man. 
I am so, I, I just send myself during those times so much love even from here because I, I had to put myself back together after each one and I really expanded after each major breakup. So like embrace the time, take your time back, do things that are, are good for you. Don't run from the feelings all the time, sit in them sometimes. Uh, I think you have to strike a balance between of like distracting yourself from the pain and feeling it. Cause I think you got to do both. Like mm -hmm. at a certain point you, you can't just sit in it and cry all the time. You got to like go have some fun and distract yourself, even if it's for a moment. Um, but it's a beautiful process learning how to come back to yourself after a breakup and like, don't try and skip it. Hmm. That's part of what you signed up for by getting with anybody. Mm -hmm. That's part of the deal, man. It's probably mm -hmm. not gonna be forever. That's not how it works almost ever. Yeah. Um, Most yeah. things in life don't last so forever. So that's my, that's my how do you survive a breakup. My part of it is um, take responsibility for your side of the breakup. Mm. And I think Hell that yeah. creates a Hell lot yeah. of freedom and a lot less like like displaced longing Hell and yeah. more more like oh okay maybe that is actually something i wanted like this all behavior i didn't wasn't really paying attention or at least it starts to make more you know what i mean yes sense definitely. when you can't this is the biggest thing that i've like learned getting healing myself is you got to keep your side of the road clean and um when you do that i don't know the heart i don't know it's a little more fertile for the grief or something yeah. like because it, it's like it's not this it's like okay yeah this was me and maybe this is something i wanted i wasn't able to say or like yeah. you know yeah this is my part of how, how long has occurred. this been how coming how here? was what i blindsided by this? yeah, yeah. What, what did i miss what it, that, yeah what was i, I not up? what was i not to? yeah what was i avoiding what, what were the red flags you? i avoided <laughs> nothing no i was gonna nope. say what is the question <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry no, but it was so heartfelt i love what you're saying <laughs> oh my god oh, yes. how do you survive a regular one yeah. Yeah. yeah oh okay okay, okay cool. daniel's he <laughs> doesn't even understand the, the yeah that's amazing <laughs> yeah he's like you just you just He's like, what do you give mean? Give them their stuff. Yeah, give them their stuff. Give them their stuff. You fucking out. send them along and keep living your life you tell, the same thank way. Thank you, young lady. <laughs> you say thank you and peace. You say thank you. Thanks. And you just keep doing the same thing right? you're doing. Okay, and then you make dinner and you look at your schedule for tomorrow. That part. <laughs> no adjustments. All right. No, it's always been a deep oh, survival man. period post it, a relationship. Yeah. But oh, that's also because I like merged identities yeah. with them. And oh, I had yeah, to like... Yeah come back to who the fuck am I now, you know? I'm a little nervous because I've never gone through a breakup sober. Wow. So that I think, I'm not like worried, but I'm just like those, just dealing with all those like Right, you've never emotions. done it without yeah. jumping to yeah. the things. Without jumping to something them. to like yeah. numb it out. That's gotta be tough. It might yeah. be tough. It might be fucking beautiful, dude. Like yeah. parts of it, obviously parts of it will just be tough, but it might yeah. be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like when you, aren't numbing the pain of like a good breakup one that really stings hmm. i'm telling you like this voice can come through that's so clear for you yeah because it's not about them anymore it's like hey babe here you are you know i think hmm. that the uh like the bpd after those episodes uh, plus the addictive behavior mm -hmm. the undiagnosed bpd it's it's a, just a chronic dysregulation of emotions yeah. like you just can't they get a swing. handle on it no yeah. matter like if it starts to like get out of the whatever the yeah and mm -hmm. so i think now that i have looked at that and have it diagnosed that's going to be an interesting play mm -hmm. an interesting part but a lot of those runs to drugs were just all of this like emotional energy that i couldn't regulate couldn't handle couldn't push away couldn't like get yeah. out of like just couldn't yeah. You know, and I didn't feel like I had any buddy or any space because number one, I wasn't creating relationships that I could go to for support. Mm -hmm. And number two, I didn't trust my familial. So like, I just didn't trust a lot of other support. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully those will be a lot better with the B B D now that that's under control. Yeah. Yeah. Embrace your breakups, baby. Yeah. Honestly. Uh, what you got, Daniel? You got another question for you us? You got another question for us. Uh, and I mean, it's right along the same lines. All right. This Ned head called Creating Lauren, Creating underscore Lauren, let's okay. get it correct, um, asks, in relationships, how do you know when someone isn't the one? 
for you? I love this question because I saw it in there too and I wanted to get to it. Mm. Um, here's my take on this. Okay, so can I tell you just one thing? No, 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 that you, no, no, that you told me yeah, yeah. before you went to Burning Man with a certain somebody that you like, it was weird being in the relationship, but knowing that it like wasn't- The a, one? Yeah. Like you literally told me that and I, I we had like dinner some random yeah. night and I was like, that's so interesting. Yeah, I've had long-term relationships where I knew it wasn't- mm. From how far in? The one. Getting into it. I didn't want wow. the one. I was young. It was like yeah. I wanted a girlfriend and I wanted the relationship and I wanted it to be good. It's not like I was shitty, but I don't think I wanted to think it was forever. Mm. I was like, I'm fucking like 19 or I'm fucking 20 something. Like, I don't want the one. Um, what I want to say about the one is I think it, 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 it's a beautiful idea and fantasy, but I think ultimately it plays out uh, toxic for all of us. This idea of the one for me, yeah. because I met someone where I felt this about, it came through me, through my feelings that I trust my intuition. I trust. I said, this is the one, this idea of soulmate. And then we, we believed into it and it was beautiful and we created this fucking thing. Ultimately, she ended up not being the one and I had to leave. And then I had to process, wait, like I knew for years, I knew a thousand percent, this is my one. Mm. For it to end, I had to let go of that idea entirely. I think, I think guys, there's a lot of people and there are special people for you, yeah. but I think there are, there are ones. Yeah, 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 totally. There are ones. Mm -hmm. Guys, don't make someone mm -hmm. like, oh my God, this is the only person who yeah. will ever get me, who will ever be yeah. right for me. Yeah. This, I think it's a toxic you're idea setting yourself up because you're setting yourself up for codependency. Yeah. You're setting yourself up for devastation. And I don't think it's true. Yeah. I don't think you can be with everybody, but I think there are definitely plenty of people in this world of 8 billion it's kind of yeah. like that you can match with well what Absolutely. you said about Chemistry. that um that cycle creation maintenance destruction that is a moldy ass lettuce mm. up in that you know yeah. yes yes it yeah. can get to be it can get there and if you're holding on it's a fantasy the idea of the one is a fantasy mm -hmm. yeah and fantasies are beautiful to dream about but you got to live in reality yeah. and yeah. like you can get stuck on how many of us, I'm sure you listeners out there, how many of us have stayed in something well past its moldy fucking simply time. Simply because of that mindset. Simply because of this idea. This is my one though. It's like, yeah. no baby, uh -huh. you're your one. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're your one. Mm -hmm. Now that we know that there is no just one, at yes. least mm -hmm. we've established that, how do you know this one isn't one of the ones? How, yeah, how, how do you know, know, how do you know when they aren't the one? When they aren't well, the there one. isn't a one, so they're well, not. <laughs> but I, <laughs> they just they are. How do you know when they're, they're not one of the ones? that? Right, right, one of the ones that you should, yeah. How do you know when you're just not it? Yeah, how do you know when it's not it? Yeah. I mean, in any relationship, right? You are avoiding, <laughs> you're avoiding things that you know you don't agree with are incompatible. You're, we all avoid red flags in the beginnings of relationships. Yeah. At this point in my life, I'm actually starting to pay attention to them mm. and actually kind of address them for real and not fit someone into an idea. I'm trying to look at the red flags, maybe discuss them and then see if they shift, not even needing them to change, see if my feelings about them shift. Like, I'm just trying to not uh, lie to myself when I'm, mm. when I'm getting to know somebody. Yeah. Not trying to blind myself. Like, no, let's see it all and then see if I still wanna keep getting closer. Um, and when knowing someone's not the one, I mean, I told you, my, my my big one, who I thought was the one, I knew I needed to leave when literally I got the clarity. Okay, she is asking me to meet her at a certain way in a conversation that she's asked it for many, many times before. If I am to meet her where she's asking me, I'm giving up all of my self-respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. Like I am, I am no longer mm -hmm. standing for myself at all. Yeah. That she's demanding me to meet her outside of who the fuck I am and what matters to me. And that became a really clear thing was, yeah. oh, if it's a choice between my dignity yeah. or meeting them where they're demanding, that's not the one and I need to go. Got you. So once you have to compromise yourself or your dignity, 
Because you're, you're willing to compromise I'm with willing a couple. To compromise. I compromise all the time. Couple behaviors, For maybe. Sure. But when it's compromising myself, like my dignity, my fucking the who the fuck I am. Yeah. <laughs> Just look if there is um, a very obvious you're giving more than you're receiving uh, or you're choosing not to receive. Look where that balance is. If it's very, pretty well in balance, that's somebody I think for me at least now is mm. like, that's very my acts of service. I love that love language. Like that's what's important to me. Mm. And just, like just being really aware of why I'm giving more or why I'm taking less. I like that. Right? Or mm. taking more and giving less. And that for me just tells me pretty quickly if I'm going to be able to do it. And if they're giving you what you need, not just giving out of like this conscious giving, if it's yeah, intentional yeah. giving, right? Yeah. Based on me and not their idea of what chivalry looks like or this, that or other. Yeah. And yeah, so that's just that genuine give and take. If it's already there in the, you know what I mean? That shouldn't, I don't feel like that's something you earn. I think give and take is like something that is either you're both like-minded and, you know, it, it's you're pretty simple what it. fair is. Yeah. yeah. And if I not, that. that's, that's something too. So I had this thing in relationships where I liked to have the upper hand, right? Whether mm. that was like, I don't know, like I felt really good about myself on set. So that's where I found a lot of people. And I found myself giving and being the one in a financially superior place mm. because it was an upper hand that was a necessity, right? Like the money kind of separated me from ever having to be intimate and deal with things in that relationship. And then I obviously started to resent them so much, bro, like so much, right. physically repulsed, like everything, right. because this dynamic that I had created mm. and, and maintained right. was killing me. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So. Part of that, like accounting for the give and take, that's part of like the dignity thing was she's asking me to meet her when I've done this so many times. And I'm asking like in that moment, I was asking her to like okay. come to a request of mine and she was demanding it be hers. And it's like that, it was part of that was like, yeah. yo, this is out of whack. I'm always meeting you where you're asking to be met. You're no longer ever meeting me where I want to be met. Yeah, it's a problem. This we're done. Like we're out. Mm -hmm. We're out mm -hmm. of here. I yeah. can't justify but, why I'm taking or like why, why I'm, I'm subjecting doing this. Myself yeah, to this. you're. Not, there's no given. It's not yeah. reciprocal anymore. There's this German poet guy Rilke who I read a lot of and just love his words. And he has some quote. I'm gonna paraphrase it, but it's like all love is great that lifts up all of your being at once and kind of raises all of you. Um, but he says, like, love kind of goes wrong when it pulls at one side of your being and distorts you. Mm. Mm. That's, interesting. That's interesting. And since That's reading that, I try and check in with it when I have like a crush on someone or start to have those feelings for someone. Like, is this kind of is this all is this lifting all of me up? Because I can feel it. I can start to feel it when it's pulling at like. It's one spot. One, yeah, it's pulling at part of me, but then therefore it's like distorting the other parts. And I can right. kind of feel that. And I love that wisdom in that. Yeah. Did you answer that? Do I know? How do I know that this person okay. is not the one? Um, I honestly would say, because I'm like Devin, I, we'll, we'll take, um, take a hint from like chemistry. All right. You got H2O. All right. Hydrogen can bond with any type of oxygen as long as it's freaking oxygen. So I think there are a lot of people out there for you. You know it's not the one if they are like, you know, putting you in danger, I think for sure, if they're making you experience emotions that are uh, damaging to you, like fear. I don't think that's something you should ever really have to feel uh, that, especially if it's a, the product of your interaction with a person. So I say just watch out for those huge red flags. Like they're not the one if you're feeling those and emotions. Fear and love, like, I just feel like if you're acting out of anything, fear doesn't always look like it's the shame, guilt, oh, like shame, all okay. of those basic I'm not emotions. Enough. That's, yes, yeah. all of that imposter syndrome, everything. That's that's what fear is. So if you're living in fear in at any capacity, like, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Remove yourself and understand that like an emotional thing. So in sobriety, it's like, yeah, you, you physically didn't drink, which is the most important, but like that emotional relapse, mm. right? Of just like, um, just evolving into this most horrible part of yourself and that emotional abuse. I don't think that, I mean, I think that that is more detrimental to the world than almost any, not, uh, I don't, I don't mean that, but I just mean like it's more subversive and just complete and, mm. and yeah, 
So I think if, if it's exacerbating wounds that you were told as a kid, if you talk to yourself in your head at night, like feeling like stupid and alone, and you have those like voices going as opposed to feeling like you're next to somebody that you can ground yourself with. I mean, your body's going to tell you and just don't like, like understand if that desperation is leading you into somebody else's arms. It does not mean hate yourself or don't look at it. It means be aware of the whole time that you're choosing this fear over your own good, hmm. right? And I think that awareness helps to stop the cycle and, hmm. and at least it lets you know what's in your control and not so much these society things that you just have to respond to. Thanks for the yeah. question. That's yeah. a... That's a that's a That's good a one. Question. Yeah, and also this idea of the one, man, it gets so perpetuated by movies and TV. Love your romantic stories that you watch in movies and TV. They are not real. They're fun yeah. stories. They're fun, happy story time. They are not real. Jim and Pam don't exist. It's not real. Okay. <laughs> um, Dianella96 asked, favorite project you've done since the end of Ned? Hmm. I'd love to know each of yours. Favorite project? Project. Yeah, favorite Ooh, project since then. Projecto. It's a toss up between um, Aliens in America and Ten Things I Hate About You mm. because for different reasons. So I was number five on the regular cast. So it's basically like on on the on the, the bottom of the of the regular cast. Mm -hmm. And so I was learning. That's where I learned to act. Right, mm. like n like no gimmicky, no nothing. Like she was somebody who was like very still, very. Um, yeah, and I just had to, I, I kind of just had to make my way. So that was exhilarating. Like I was just mm. like very present. I was on. And then 10 things Especially I hate. Especially post-Neds. Right? Yeah. And 10 things I hate about you was just this like culmination of all the years up to that point and like making it to number one on the call sheet was important to me, no matter how superficial that is. Like no, that was a goal that, that just made me like so happy. And that you just getting to achieve that and then just feeling like this feminist voice that I got to use. Like all these characters are always a conduit to things that I'm feeling. And that was probably one of the most positive times in my life is when I was shooting that. And I felt so very empowered. I mean, mine would probably be Zeke and Luther. It was just like a fun show to work, you know, skateboarding, everything like that. I was always into extreme sports. So probably that one. I really enjoyed that. Um, I got to be like a bad boy on like Glee, like Phil Lipoff. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had the braid, so it was the first time I had that kind hey. of look. I want to rewatch like, that. Yeah. I remember I, I saw you on that like first, you know, when I, whatever came out, but I got one to rewatch. Um, How was that? Like when you booked that, like was that like one of those moments? Because that's a prime time was show. Huge. Which was, yeah. It was top huge. Of its game. Yeah. yeah. I, thought it was, I thought it was dope. I mean, like I was only there a couple, you know, episodes. So it wasn't that crazy. But, Still. Yeah. All right. It was dope. Yeah. Glee was, yeah, it was at the top. So it yeah. felt, felt good being on a project like that my favorite project since ned's is a complicated one um by the time this airs i feel like we'll have finished it um but mm -hmm. it's a movie called rust yeah that you may have heard of um the story with that is i had worked with this writer director twice before i did two films with him this one called crown vic was really cool got to work with thomas jane that project was my favorite project after ned's before Rust was I got to play this like crazy tweaked out arrested guy in this one long scene with Thomas Jane where he like strips me naked to humiliate me and interrogates me and I'm like kind of a fucking tweaker and it was so fun because it it, it was the furthest I've ever played from myself mm. so it was hard ass work to to figure out how to get there in a lot of roles I can just let if the character is close enough to me I can do my acting work on it, but let a lot of my own experience just fill in yeah. the blanks of the character. This, I couldn't let any of my life experience fill in this character. It, it was so far from who I am, so I had to really dig into it. But anyway, did that movie a couple years back. Um, Joel's next movie was a Western called Rust. Um, Alec Baldwin was attached. Uh, and I, re I mean, a Western is like an actor's fucking dream. It's one of the m classic genres of film. So to get, I got cast um, as a supporting role in that to be a fucking cowboy <laughs> on this period piece Western. And I mean, it, it was coming after a really like dark time in my life and dark time in my acting life. Like I felt so far removed from my career at that point. And then I was on this set in a Western with actors that I respected the fuck out of learning how to ride uh, a horse, 
like in period piece garb. I got to play, I was no longer one of the kids. I was one of the men on set and I was playing this grungy ass like character role. And I was literally living my dream on that set. Like it felt so good. I felt so on purpose again. I felt like my life was possible again. I felt like my dreams were possible again. Like it was really a sacred time that was healing me. And then as we know, like we're like three weeks into shooting. I was two days away from being done. Um, uh, we had this huge accident um, where our DP got shot and killed. And like, man, it has been a hard year after that. Like that, that has been so fucking hard to deal with and process. Um, be kind of because of all that, like it's this loss of life. It was the moment it hit me. It was all the press about it after. Like everyone has an idea of what that set was, but if you weren't on it, you don't fucking know. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't this narrative that went out. Like every set has some chaos. Every set is cutting corners and cutting budgets. I never at least I can only speak from my experience. But on my experience, it, it it was no different than any other set I'd ever been on. It didn't feel more unsafe. I had a gun every day. It felt I felt safe with it. Like I felt safe with the people. Um, and we were just making a movie, man. People, it was not this crazy stressed set beyond the normal, beyond what a normal set is. And everyone has opinions about it because of all the stories that went out. And look, you're all entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to my experience. Um, and like, this was a deeply personal experience for everyone who was on set to go through this trauma together. Like this goes beyond uh, anyone else's opinion who wasn't there. Like we all had to survive this and like process the grief of this beautiful person who got killed and who was like really special to our set. Um, she's a really talented artist and like a really beautiful person. Um, and to lose her while making a movie, you can't understand what that is like for, for Alec included. You can't understand being on a set is so fucking sacred and so fucking special. It's so beautiful. There's this energy that's happening. There's this fucking awesomeness about we get to do this. And we all felt that with making a Western. I think all of us felt like, we're wow, man. Like we're making like one of these like genre films that's like we've all grown up watching. Like we're doing our version of this Western. And like I felt that energy on set. I felt it with Helena. I felt it with a lot of the people on set. This kind of like joy. Alec too, this joy of making this this thing and for it to end like that was motherfucking devastating. And I know it's super complicated for people that we are finishing it, but I'm glad. I'm glad we're finishing it and we're finishing it um, with her husband and I'm glad about that. He's the new. He's, he wants it to be finished as far as I know and he, he's, he's an executive producer on it now and like just uh -huh. he's involved. We would uh -huh. never touch it if he wasn't. We, hmm. I, I was sure we would never finish this movie. Yeah. I was 100% sure this is never getting done. Like there's no way we're gonna finish this movie yeah. ever. I knew it was over, like never thought. So I was actually really shocked to find out we were finishing it and ultimately just on a personal level for each of us i don't think i don't think critics you can't separate the loss of life so i think on social media say whatever the fuck you're going to say i think critics the movie's never going to be good enough to lose a person like no movie never is yeah. so i don't think that will but for us personally finishing this thing that like harmed and hurt so many of us and just like created this rift in our lives uh, i just it feels like some kind of completion that feels right. Yeah. And so I hope it comes out well. And it's, it's my favorite project since Ned's, even yeah. though this shit happened, at least the time before she got killed, because I was living my fucking dream in a really cool way. I'm, I'm yeah. glad for you. And yeah, I'm, thanks. You know, thanks. Gotcha Excited thing, to see what comes out of that. That's really lovely that um, the blessing of her husband and that he's a part of it. Yeah. So the tip for this episode would just be um, to find out why and if you're taking crap from somebody else for some reason that doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Or that you can get through. Like, are you with them because you're reciprocal and like it's a it's a nice this or are you with them for fear of being alone or for fear of anything else mm. for me i would say uh, a tip is to choose people to be around that uh uplift you uh if someone is bringing down your energy i don't think you need that person around okay 
Sorry, that's another really good thing. Just take, just take, no, 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 just take inventory after you hang out with your friends of how you feel. Cause I didn't do that for the longest right. time. And even the kindest, well, most well intentioned people, like, can be energy. Do vampires, I feel super right? drained? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or so paying attention to life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a big do one. Do I feel comforted? Simple. Yeah, mm -hmm. all that. Um, mine is you are your one. You um. are the one you will be with for your entire life. Yeah. So get to know yourself. Fall in love with yourself. You are your one. And then there's many partners you can let into that space. Yes. Choose wisely. Love that. Oh. Love you. <sighs> your results may vary. Your, your results may vary. Yes. Uh, thanks for listening, Ned Heads. Thanks for submitting your questions. Look out for the next Insta story where we ask for them. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> All right. Cheers, Pete. Che che cheers. All right, Ned Heads, thanks for watching this episode of the Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide Pod. If you want more content, please subscribe to our Patreon for more bonus material.